So let me um, uh, welcome now with real delight, personal pleasure, uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Ambassador Sayyid Tanin. And uh, let me um, uh, do this now in a, in a different fashion a bit. Um, and that is, um, we spoke before about uh, the larger regional uh, concepts. Uh, we had a brief um, 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 uh, idea of how apparently there are uh, some um, um, quite interesting signs of um, positive development which um, um, Colonel Gardiner uh, brought forward with statements both from the President of the United States as well as from um, 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 various observers about the situation in Iran by Iranians themselves, by Israelis, as we have heard them the last weekend, uh, where one seems to uh, uh, try to find perhaps ways to move forward. Uh, and uh, for me that leads back to um, um, the country which you represent and the region and country which the incident, I and uh, obviously the World Russian School, have been interested quite intensely in the last uh, decade. Uh, we're already from our 2010 meeting, if you remember, Ambassador, we had these uh, four notions of tranquility, stability, sovereignty, and realities. And uh, um, uh, Afghanistan finds itself now in this transition phase uh, where we hope that as of 2014, the country has its full um, um, uh, sovereignty and security sovereignty and uh, uh, is uh, then able to um, um, uh, develop uh, uh, really on the, those uh, positive uh, items which have been built uh, um, uh, uh, in the country and if you go to Kabul it looks slightly different now than it looked, uh, majorly different than it looked uh, let's say 2003. Um, uh, but also it's obvious that uh, for the country to be able to develop like this it needs a certain amount of stability around itself. And for those of you who are interested in history, the Afghans would tell you sometimes with exasperation, don't repeat 1991. Why? Because you may all remember that by 1990, the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan after it had some bloody experiences there. But the United States of America was suddenly preoccupied with what in Kuwait? Deliberate Kuwait. And that one, all interest in Afghanistan and the region vanished because we had Kuwait and the Iraq. And um, uh, what then happened in Afghanistan uh, as a follow-on was certainly that Afghanistan was left to itself and uh, nothing of that, all what was promised, uh, at the early 1990s materialized, and uh, the result of it is well known. So the Afghans uh, have always been uh, a people which uh, took it upon themselves to rebuild and to revamp and to move forward, uh, but now in view of um, uh, foreign presence since 2001 fall, uh, obviously the country has uh, uh, different uh, um, agendas, both within both amongst its own, its own uh, ethnic groups and also within and with its neighbors in the region. And nobody else is more qualified than to bring this Afghan message to us who live abroad than you are. You have done so many times with great uh, success. Uh, because um, Ambassador Tanin was not only um, um, has not only been uh, ambassador, permanent representative of Afghanistan in the United Nations since uh, uh, many years, but before that he has actually done a lot to keep um, the information about Afghanistan and concerning Afghanistan running through his work in BBC. And I'm sure that has helped him um, with uh, uh, his work in the United Nations where many times he also um, uh, presented uh, Afghanistan in front of the UN Security Council, but he also was vice chairman of, uh, or vice president of uh, general assemblies um, in the last couple of years, and he is chairman, co-chairman of the uh, permanent group, uh, freestanding group of um, the um, um, 
reform uh, through for the United Nations Security Council. So in many ways you have done many things which are above and beyond your duty on Afghanistan. And uh, besides the fact that you have been always in our Liechtenstein for many years. So with this, so I give you the floor now. And we would love to hear your perspective as you see this uh, from uh, uh, the Afghan um, uh, position today on your messages which you have. It's you can get an Afghanistan map here. You're standing in front of an Afghanistan flag. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here amongst you. Uh, and uh, to be part of that debate uh, uh, on uh, crisis diplomacy at the grassroots. Afghanistan it's, uh, and the macro region. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Wolfgang uh, Donspeck Greber uh, and the uh, Liechtenstein Institute uh, uh, for Self Determination and uh, Woodrow Wilson School of International and Public Affairs, <coughs> not only for bringing us together here today, but for their initiatives that is. Uh, always uh, 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 taking uh, people from different parts of our region, other regions, to contribute to the better understanding of the rest of the world, uh, especially uh, as this series is uh, indicating where people suffer from crisis. I am very sorry to be late a little bit. Uh, it shouldn't be seen any, as any site of uh, unpoliteness because that there was a traffic and uh, we were not, uh, uh, for the first time, we were, we, we were not uh, well in this uh, anticipation of the distance. And there's maybe the weather and other things also contributed. I missed the other part, uh, the first part, which was Syria, but let me before discussing on Afghanistan, looking into that map, uh, I'm trying to find out what is, what is bringing us together in this region, what, thing, what is uh, uh, take us uh, far from each other. Uh, it's difficult. I think uh, if, if anything is apart from Islam culture and uh, belonging to a civilization that, that is rooted in history because, for example, Syria and Afghanistan were two important uh, roundabouts of, I mean, bigger Syria, historical Syria, of, of the old civilizations uh, in these two parts. We are not in the cul-de-sac of the history. Uh, but uh, apart from these uh, communalities, uh, it's the stability or instability that bring us together or, or not. So what we need is a stability. And this is, this is it's important for many countries in this region. The zones of stabilities are, as you see here, are not, uh, are not the same. What we have here is very different from what you now experience or in the last couple of years here in <coughs> Syria, and what you have in Northern Africa, and of even uh, the nature of the instability in any of these uh, countries are not the same. On Syria, we talk about humanitarian in un intervention on the one hand, and classical diplomacy for a political solution on the other. In North Africa, we talk about the end of, uh, uh, end of uh, brutalities of one regime or the suppression of another. So democratization or, or end of a dictatorship uh, is, is, was what could uh, bring together the situation in, from Egypt to, to Libya. 
So, but what is happening in our part of the region is uh, about a 10 years of stabilization efforts in Afghanistan where the United States, NATO, and the international community is in the center. And it is the main important post-Cold War shared international regional common operation uh, in, the in, in our view, in the center of a, a, a part of the world where the geopolitics of, the, of this century is being played. So let me, let me share with you here today a few observations. Uh, first, how we see Afghanistan now, how we see Afghanistan in, the rela in relation with the United States, to be able to see it, how uh, it relates itself and the situation is affecting or being affected or affecting the situation in that part of the world that is in front of you. In summary, this discussion is happening today in an important time for Afghanistan. Uh, we are amidst the transition uh, and uh, we are now looking forward to a uh, decade of transformation that is agreed between Afghanistan and international and its international partners last December in, uh, in Bonn in Germany. Uh, we uh, tried through all the debates in the last couple of years uh, to draw up a map for transition from a military phase to a non-military phase in, until 2014 and also putting Afghanistan in a stable path uh, in the next decade, 2015-2024. So a narrative of the future role through that debate was redrawn, uh, where uh, we defined the scope uh, of national ownership and national leadership, uh, which uh, in, 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 in fact uh, uh, is about a comprehensive process of building uh, national sovereignty in all areas in Afghanistan. So through this uh, transition uh, process, uh, it has become now imperative for Afghanistan to deal with three normalizations. Normalization of the security situation, normalization of political and, and social situation, and the norm normalization of the international presence in Afghanistan. Uh, all these three normalizations, in our view, are interlinked. And, and uh, they will uh, not be, we know that as uh, there will be uh, not the same military presence after 2014, the extraordinary nature of relations of the international community, including the United States with Afghanistan, will be substituted by a different form of uh, bilateral and also multilateral uh, partnership, uh, which is in a sense about managing an end for a first period of or first decade of uh, military engagement in Afghanistan and uh, drawing a new phase of partnership with Afghanistan and through Afghanistan and that region. So with that, uh, what I am uh, trying to say is that uh, uh, the core of this normalization that I'm talking about is a new arrangement where we try to put Afghanistan in a position to take the lead and uh, to, to be in the center. Uh, we are now at the verge of uh, beginning the third phase of transition, security transition, where Afghans will be in charge of, at the end of that phase, in charge of two-thirds of the territory's security issues 
its defense and dealing with the security of issues. And uh, with the, the fifth part, until 2014, Afghan forces, uh, the National Army, National Police should be in charge of their own, uh, all areas of the country. But still we think that uh, through that new form of relations with the United States, with NATO, with our allies, and also with cooperation of the region, we will be, uh, we still uh, hope and, and we still would like to see international support to continue for the training and, and, and uh, uh, supporting the Afghan uh, national forces efforts in Afghanistan. So it's within that uh, context that we uh, uh, regard uh, the role of the international community uh, and then we uh, prepared and agreed this week, or just last week, let's say, the strategic partnership agreement uh, between Afghanistan and the United <coughs> States, which will confirm the importance of such an uh, uh, inter international partnership. This is strategic partnership, which is going to be signed before Chicago uh, summit in a few weeks. Uh, uh, which is going to be at the end of this month, I mean, uh, will help shape the international community's rule through the transformation decade uh, until 2024 in Afghanistan. So, Afghanistan made a choice to start it, the new decade of its partnership with the international community with preparing itself to sign the main strategic partnership with the United States. The general contours of this agreement is about uh, the support, the security, and, and, and other supports that Afghanistan can get from the United States while uh, Afghanistan is uh, is ready to work as an ally and partner of the United States uh, uh, with the obligations that it should take uh, in building a, a, a state that is accountable, that's clean, that's functioning, and that's working, working together with uh, its uh, international partners, including the United States, for peace, stability, and security in the region. But, and this choice would allow us now also to, uh, uh, to, bring, to, 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 to bring in on the board to expand the scope of cooperation with all other countries in the region. So the realities of the last 10 years is becoming the basis of a move of the next 10 years. Uh, we cannot be successful if we are ignorant of that geographical security strategic realities that is surrounding us in that region. Afghanistan is, as you see here in the map, in the conjecture or in the center of three regions. This is uh, the central uh, Asia and Euro-Asia in the, in, the, in the north. This is the South Asia in the south. It's the west or the Middle East uh, in the west. So we... Excuse me, I'm grateful, really grateful that you raised this, what you just said. The correct geographical termination for Afghanistan's location is West South Asia. I'm delighted that the ambassador, I tested my friends in various positions in Washington, asking them whether they know it. 95% called Afghanistan the extended part of the Middle East. Only Pakistan then does belong to the same one. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, the, 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 
the temptation for lo locating you somewhere will go on because it depends on the foreign ministries where they put you. Yeah. Afghanistan is part of the Euro-Asia department of one, some countries, South Asia departments of some other foreign ministries, and uh, maybe West Asia, uh, yeah. uh, Middle East. And then uh, it depends on how you see it. The French see the Middle East as a proche, uh, uh, proche Orient, which was close to them. And we see it as Far East maybe, but there is someone else who saw it in the middle. So this is, uh, uh, we are, and, and then when we say that Afghanistan is in the center, it, in, and you see that, the west part as big, it doesn't look as a center. But this centrality is, uh, is not about being here. Actually, in that map, if you're here, that's the center. But when, uh, when you, you, it, you're, you're out, you're looking out of that map, uh, this centrality is about how to link East and West Asia. That is what is strategic. That is what is economy, econo, eco strategy. strategy. So I, I mean the Jew strategy, the Jew economy, and the geopolitical importance, uh, meaning of the centrality is not to be really in the center, right? Uh, so, for this reason, we are in the middle of that, these regions. Uh, and then, at the same time, Afghanistan is living with two big important neighbors. That's Pakistan and Iran. And both countries are now, uh, have, have now been for a long time uh, uh, in, the, in the middle of our concerns in the middle of thinking of all, uh, all uh, countries who are involved in that region, uh, whether they are involved economically, politically, strategically, they look into these two countries. It's Pakistan, since 1970s, since Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's uh, prime ministership, became the first Islamic country to have an atomic bomb. And then, secondly, Pakistan created the second Islamic at atomic bomb, that was jihad, right? It was, it was, uh, Ziaul Haq came to power with one slogan, jihad fi sabilullah, jihad, fight in the way of God. The main doctrine came, of course, uh, a decade ago, uh, but he was the one who raised that flag. So these two, and then Pakistan, and with an Islamic, what they call it, Islamic atomic bomb, and with jihad, became the center of Islamic uh, armed international. This is the only Islamic country in the world that have the, the ability to, to influence the situation in many parts of the world. The most important, uh, uh, armed militant Islamic group of Uzbekistan, of Chechnya, of Central Asia, of North African countries, of Kashmir, of India, of Afghanistan, all are in Pakistan. And they are armed, they, are, they have a presence in Arabs also. So this is why Pakistan is an important country, not because you are always, when, as the American media say that it has a bomb, it has the jihadi bomb, and it has the infrastructure of the jihad that is still there. And then you have Iran, right? Iran is the first Islamic, where the, I think the, 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 the birthplace of the first Islamic revolution. Do Zia uh, the, the prime minister of Pakistan in 1970s, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was the first person who, in the third constitution of Pakistan, made Islam as a state religion officially, but Khomeini was the first leader in the Islamic world who put Islam, who put the religion as uh, the guidance of politics, as a center of politics, a state that is, that is uh, run by religion. So the state for the first time became an Islamic world under Khomeini after Iranian revolution become, halfly at least, 
part, not partly, uh, the representative of the God in, on the earth rather than the representative of people uh, in the country. So then, of course, there is this debate about, uh, about uh, uh, nuclear Iran, and, and there is also this strategic focus of two, uh, or, or, or strategic uh, hysteria of, of the United States and, and Israel about Iran that can lead to a war. We live between these two countries. Let's call them, we, be, we live between two atomic bombs. <laughs> Do Iranians may not have a bomb, but they have the possibility they can have a capacity. They're big. There's 70 million people in Iran. It's a big country. And then you have Pakistan that is, that is also uh, a country with uh, quite big. Uh, do, and then we, we are in, in, this, in the middle of these two, two things. The dynamics, of course, of the politics and of strategies that are, 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 are moving are not the same in, the, in both countries. Uh, and then, uh, of course, this region, if we are in the center of a region, we are neighboring. We, we are talking about immediate neighbors and extended neighbors. And the extended neighbor includes Russia, uh, the former Soviet Union, China, and, and India. So then we have this uh, Arabian Peninsula. <coughs> no? It is not atomic, but it's rich. It is influential. And uh, they have a big effect in Afghanistan uh, through all these years of war against the Soviet Union, the Mujahideen wars, the Taliban wars, even today. If you remember, three countries recognized the Taliban government. It was Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, it was Emirate, and it was Pakistan. So now we have the first office for, not, not yet, we will have an office for dialogue with the Taliban in that area, which is Qatar, and possibly in Saudi Arabia also. So this is, this is the region we talk about. And then we have the United States. Not to NATO for the first time out of Europe or here. This is against. Uh, and in such a situation, what is important is that uh, how, uh, and Afghanistan also historically was, was there, and it was uh, a geographical land bridge between these areas when these big powers were not, not the big powers of today. Uh, and also it was a cultural uh, uh, hub, uh, a center of civilization. Of course, people talk about how the, the crossroad for, for conquer, conquering India and, and, and empires, but I mean, it's, it has its uh, historical, uh, uh, historical, cultural, civilizational, and strategic, strategic uh, centrality, uh, the, the, the famous uh, British historian Arnold Toynbee, uh, he, uh, he was talking about how Afghanistan suffered, suffered in reality from two, the emergence of two powers. One was Genghis Khan, when who occupied Afghanistan, he, he didn't try also, he, he also not only try or didn't try to kill people, but he also eliminated the whole infrastructure, the irrigation system, the possibility of living in the future. So Afghanistan became a dry country because of Genghis Khan's uh, his, uh, his brutality. That's, uh, that's one of the, uh, I mean, that's the most important how a country which, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which, was part of this, uh, writ I mean, the written or existing 5,000 years of history, right? The documents, as say, became a country that's, that's dry, that is, that is uh, not looking like to represent that history. I'm coming, I, my birthplace name is Kapisa. So I was uh, looking, uh, this is uh, 300 BC. It was the main uh, imperium for 
a wine business, uh, Caviciana. So it's because it's the country of the gr of the of the grapes, and uh, and if it, and the Kabul National Museum, uh, and th from that area became a rich museum because that was a hist that's about two hundred thousand. Uh, five, 2,500 200, 2, uh, 2, uh, years history. Uh, so, but, but if you go now, the center of that region is Bagram, and the only civilization is the presence of the American forces. Oh, right? Or yeah. right? <laughs> uh, maybe others, there are some. So this is... They have a museum on the base. Yeah, it's, it's the mountain around. But also, it's the center of this. Uh, so what I'm saying is this is, this is a the centrality that uh, we need. But what is, what is what the situation is now? After 10 years, if all, in all these uh, achievements, I think uh, Afghanistan is not stable. We still face the challenges of terrorism, the narcotics, and, uh, 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 and also the weak economy. Uh, we uh, Unfortunately, we haven't been able together uh, to build a sufficiently functioning state in the last two years, despite the, uh, the whole energy uh, we spent and the sweats and the bloods and, and, and money that were given. Uh, so these challenges are not only national, most of these challenges can be seen as regional challenges. There's trans-border terrorism, trans-border narcotics uh, 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 trades, and, and, uh, and uh, there's uh, these challenges, and there's lack of cooperation, there's zones of instab instabilities, and, and, and these challenges cannot be addressed alone by Afghanistan. It cannot be also addressed only through Afghan-American uh, strategic partnership. It, all these challenges, I mean, the negative trends there, uh, the threats there, needs a regional approach. We need to involve our, our neighbors. We need to also to involve our extended neighbors. Uh, then, of course, it is how to turn these negative trends into positive. How to, instead of this uh, uh, instead, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, the threats of terrorism and, uh, and insurgencies and the wars. How to how to create a, an economic cooperation zone where we would be able to link Central Asia to South Asia. Central Asia is the, the <laughs> Middle East of tomorrow, with all these hydrocarbon resources where the consu consumer market of the Southeast uh, is expanding and extending to the East Asia also. So if the gas, if the gas of, of Uzbekistan, one of uh, Turkmenistan, as one of the biggest sources of gas, uh, if it has the main market that they can, they can go is South Asia and East Asia, but through Afghanistan and Pakistan. Tapi project. So, and at the same time, I think we have, we cannot address issues like water shortages, electricity shortages, oil, and none of, none of these, uh, uh, I mean, the, the problems without each other. Now we import uh, water from Tajikistan. Uh, Pakistan is depending to our, uh, uh, I mean, so source of waters. We have, we have, with Iran, we, need, we have the same needs, mutual needs. Electricity is something that we, now there is a big network of exchange of electricity. We are importers, others are exporters. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan are, are, are part of that electricity exchange market or trade market. But I've, the, the problem is still we, we, we live between this, uh, Dealing with the threats, facing the threats, and, all, and, and opening the opportunities for cooperation. We are not still somewhere 
to see uh, that the negative potential uh, of, of, of the situation turn into a positive prospect of cooperation. We, last year, in November, 2nd November, in process, we embarked on a new process that we call it the Istanbul process. The process that, that's bringing 14 countries of what we call it heart of Asia. It includes uh, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, Iran, all these five, six, uh, stands. Uh, you call it stand, we call it Central Asia, uh, Turkey, uh, also Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, China, Russia, uh, India. So we have, we have that potential and we in next June, uh, in 40, on 14 June, we will have the second ministerial conference of the countries that is now members of, uh, of this Istanbul process. Uh, then, a uh, few days ago in Ashgabat, in Turkmenistan, there was a meeting where at the ministerial level or at deputy foreign minister level that they decided that this, uh, uh, the Istanbul pro members of the Istanbul process at ministerial level should meet twice a year. One in, in the, during the General Assembly here in New York, uh, and the second in, uh, in, in, in one of the capitals uh, so of, of these countries. It's maybe expanded by us, including of Azerbaijan uh, in June to 15 countries. There were some, uh, some uh, doubts about that process. Russia, uh, China, and others uh, still were a little bit hesitant to see what we mean by that, because we have other mechanisms for regional cooperation, mainly economic cooperation. But this one is a security, a, a, a political, a, a form, form of, of cooperation that is taking us together towards a better stable situation. And in here, United, the United States, uh, or some of our NATO allies are participating as, as observers and they're part of that process, supporting that process, including a, a role that we have for the United Nations. So then we have other mechanisms also. This is the bilateral, uh, the trilaterals we have. Trilateral between America, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, which is a little bit in, uh, uh, recently in, uh, in, in, in coma, but we, we will, we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll uh, bring it back soon. And then we have other tri regional trilaterals like Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And then Afghanistan is becoming an observer of Shanghai cooperation. So uh, at the same time, we, have, we are trying to, to renegotiate with NATO a f new f uh, frame of partner strategic partnership. I think if you put this, this, the partnership strategic of Afghanistan in the United States, states in the center, which is going to be soon inked by the presidents of two countries, Afghanistan and the United States, then around that you can build. We have a, n a number of new partnership strategies with, with Britain, with France, with Italy, soon with Australia, uh, and possibly Germany. So with that, then uh, we will have also, we are part of SARC, that is the South Asian uh, Economic Organization, ECO, uh, economic organization uh, that, that's uh, bringing us in, uh, uh, in cent the Central Asian countries and some Middle Eastern countries, uh, Turkey and others. So despite that, we have um, uh, bilateral, multilateral organizations. Now we have to focus how they work, how they work in a coherent way. At this stage, I think, for regional cooperation, there are two uh, issues that I, uh, I have to highlight that are important. One, how, how to go through a series of uh, confidence-building measures. Uh, how to have counter-narcotics cooperations, how to have uh, counter-terrorism cooperations, even how, how to have counter-disaster cooperations. This can, these areas is not only about good things, it's about earthquakes, about floods, about a lot of natural disasters, right? Uh, the biggest, the highest mountains are there. And so, and then of course, it's the 
the, 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 the private sector, how they can work together. These are all part of the uh, a part of of uh, uh, confidence building measure CBMs. But uh, of course, we would like to see how this strategic partnership of the United States within the United States and the center can work. And we think we, we need, need more uh, agreements and memorandum, memorandum of, of understandings to detail some of the main general agreements. Uh, but it's not against Iran. It's not against Pakistan. It's not against Russia. It's not against China. It is, it is a context where also work within that context, with that, that, that uh, idea of having all region together, with, with, where that is, that is not ignorant of the need and the necessity of, the, of uh, making regional cooperation uh, a, a dynamic process of today and future. So who, those who see the role of America in that region, whether the eastern part or the western part, in terms of a, 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 a dominant military force, uh, shouldn't be uh, ignorant of the fact that the United States is involved in, in, in uh, many important strategic efforts that, is, that are not only military. So, and then uh, I think this is an area where the United States, NATO can work together with three big emerging powers like Russia, China, and, and, and India. At the same time, I think they can uh, work with both regions. At the end of the day, I think uh, our future is about living in peace, work with each other rather than fight with each other. Fight between ourselves, fight with others. This is what is characterizing the life of, of this region through the uh, media outlet. And we are, uh, we see it. Of course, there was Arab revolt in, in 1920s, and there is Arab Spring in, 19, in 2011 onward. But this is not uh, about the future. It's about, uh, about uh, how these countries moving towards future, through war or, or other uh, means. Everybody would like to live in a better situation. And uh, I think in this globalized world, uh, Afghanistan is one of the countries that can build uh, through this uh, uh, ingredient of globalization and, and become a uh, building block of a globalized relation in that part of the region. I think I talk too much. Thank you. Toward stability, uh, will you have? Do you anticipate the cooperation of the Taliban, or what would their role be in response to these efforts? Nice question. You have three minutes. <laughs> uh, I, my focus was on the region, uh, but it was in terms of what Wolfgang wanted to see. Uh, how this big region uh, worked between the mountains. Uh, the regional cooperation is also about, I mean, the stabilization of this three normalization in Afghanistan, I said normalization of security, normalization of political and social situation, normalization of international presence. This is also about a political solution. You cannot stable Afghanistan without having a political solution. One of the most important component of this political solution is the peace talks and reconciliation with the Taliban. Uh, this is why I think uh, now uh, we try to, to focus not only on military efforts until 2014 to make Afghan army and Afghan police enable enough to deal with the security situation, but also bringing in the Taliban to dry up the sources of instability. That's the reason. Uh, but, of course, the scene is uh, that if, 
If it was as easy as I'm talking about, then of course we would have been in a better situation. The Taliban is a different creature. They fought against us uh, with brutality, and uh, they are a, br a formidable force of, of destruction. The most important job is not only to talk to them, but, but to turn them into an inter interlocutor first. That's also about CBMs. This cutter office, if it's going to be open, is first of all about enabling them to, to, to talk politically how they are going to be part of the process, to what extent they are going to be part of the, the process, there are many factors that need to be seen. It is the Taliban's willingness, it is our willingness, the Afghan other side willingness, uh, to be ready to, to accommodate them, uh, to be open-minded enough about a political solution, and also it's about the neighbors. The Taliban sanctuaries are in Pakistan. Without Pakistan's help, without Pakistan's real involvement, uh, they may not have the liberty to, to choose a peaceful way. So then, of course, they have some sources in the Arabic countries. This is the complexities uh, that uh, requires that not only to talk to them, to bring them in, but, but also to engage uh, region. So another element, uh, another side of the regional cooperation is how to help the Afghan political solution to realize to be realized. Thank you, Mr. That was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, is there, I wanted to add something to the Taliban, if you don't mind, since it's my mistake anyway. No, no, you, you're, you have an academic freedom, so yes. you can say anything you like. Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are three elements which are really important in this. That is, number one, First and foremost, the relationship between the Afghans, the Afghan elite, and the Afghans as such with the Taliban is an Afghan network. Number two, there is very clear a procedure that all those, I have to say, in one of the meetings where you were, thanks God, many years ago with me, I still heard only a dead. Taliban is a good Taliban. Uh -huh. Of representatives of this side of the Atlantic. We have left that notion. We have a very clear understanding now that anybody, as in any other country of the world, which has who has raised arms or resistance against its government can under certain circumstances be brought back, as you rightly said, turned around both. Provided that person resigns and refrains from using arms and force and subscribes to the condition, uh, constitution of the country. That has been generally understood from Northern Ireland to ETA and other places. Number three, and I'm so glad the ambassador raised it, and that's why I want to put Afghanistan into the regional context, because the Balkans and other parts of the world have always um, very clearly indicated to us, if you don't put a certain element, a certain system, within the larger system, you will never make it. There are others than just the Afghans who might have an interest in continued role of the Taliban. And here comes now my regional concept. Provided it is clear to both the Afghan government, the Afghans, and their neighborhood that the international community has not lost its interest, has not abandoned its involvement, not just on paper, but in reality, only deeds count. And also demonstrates to the neighborhood that yes, there is still a continued real interest. Provided these conditions are fulfilled, then any negotiations between whomever in Afghanistan with the Taliban or whomever will work. The moment, however, any of the parties involved realizes that the mouse has left the house. Oh, the cat has left the house. <laughs> Many others might want to explore that. 
And it is generally forgotten as an asset done in that event. But Iran not only poured us on Afghanistan, but Iran poured us also on Pakistan. And it is also not always considered that Pakistan itself has an issue or two with its own major neighbor, which doesn't happen to be Afghanistan, but India. So you have this and I love your extended neighborhood notion, which is just there. On the other hand, you cannot understand any of Iranian deals or dealings with the Gulf if you don't consider also what's happening between Tehran and Kabul and Oman or Dubai. And if I tell you that when Saudi Arabia did whatever it took, to stabilize, by its means, Bahrain, which kind of forces did Saudi Arabia use? Yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. No Saudi forces, but Pakistani forces. So just to give a clear indication, and this is published evidence. And this hangs together with something the ambassador has not mentioned, but I as an academic can say. There is an inter-Islamic divide, Shia and Sunni and others. And does it play a role? Yes, indeed. Does this play a role for the negotiations you referred to? Yes, absolutely. Is it mentioned? No. And then finally, of course, it was very clear that everything was quite smoothly in Afghanistan till March 19, 2003. The moment we had the war in Iraq, the ambiance changed in Afghanistan. And I speak of something I believe. And my prediction is, if on the one hand the international community wants to have a stable and tranquil reality in and around Afghanistan, it better is aware that anything which happens <coughs> between there and the Mediterranean has effects, at the very least, through perception. I actually wanted to invite um, Gardina to ask a question to Ambassador Tony. The Iranian <laughs> connection. Uh, to what extent is stability dependent upon the unlocking of the relationship between the United States and Israel? You're off the record. So, wait, wait. Uh, I'm, I'm always off the record. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware of that. Uh, so, uh, you, you can see Iran only through the prism of Afghan stabilization or efforts. Or you can see Iran, see Iran through that bigger picture uh, that Wolfgang is trying to, to shape, no? The connection of this whole region and the, and, and the role of the United States here. Uh, of course, on Afghanis with Afghanistan, I think Iran has two big, three big influences. Uh, four big influences here. One is in Afghanistan among not only the Shiite community, which is 15, they, they themselves say 20% of the communities, but also among non-Pashtun, uh, among, um, let's, let's make it simple, who, do, who, who are not following the Afghan history, but all of us following that. Uh, among part of the population that has ethnic, ethnic, ethnic or linguistic or cultural relations with Iran, because we are also with Iran, like you with British share something we call it the same language, right? Uh, and and uh, we speak the same language. This is this is very important. So this is the Iranian influence. This influences culture. This influences financial. This influences uh, uh, intelligence. This influences political. It's re religious also, ideological. So all. All dimensions of an important uh, influence that the country can have 
and maybe half of Afghanistan or one third of Afghanistan by Iran is there. That's one. It has the similar, maybe bigger influence in Iraq. That's the second. The third influence is a strategic bigger <coughs> that is Syria, Lebanon. What, what was this? Syria, Lebanon. Right. You know. And of course, and then you have Bahrain in that Arab Peninsula. There are shares. And Bahrain, we, we would like to ignore it. We would like to believe what the scene is telling us. Uh, uh, or, or because they are not talking about these things. And, but Bahrain, in reality, is, as, is, is, uh, is not a dominant Sunni Gulf country. And we have the, the bigger, the, a, a number of Shia communi communities in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And, uh, and this, is, this is the biggest uh, concern there. Mm. So at the same time, I think there is a bigger influence, which is not only religion, in Emirate. Uh, because it is, it is the, uh, the, the, the two, uh, the, the presence of Iranians here also, and this is the, the, uh, the closeness. So Iran, and then it, it comes to what you said, this divide of Shia, Sunni Shia. Syria is the most important example of the United States and the West aligning itself with the whole Sunni, Sunni world and the view of people there against the Shiite Islam, whether they are Alawites or, or Jafaris of Iran or other Shiites. So the danger is, because you see, uh, when, when it comes to Syria, the idea of humanitarian intervention or ending Assad's regime, it is also about uh, the Gulf thinking, Turkish thinking, uh, European thinking, American strategies in Israelis. No? Of course, one, uh, an ignorant like me, can see it as one uh, problem from the outside. But when you look at from out inside, there are different strategies that are meeting at some points with each other. right? People put their plan into plan of someone else. Of course, there is someone bigger than anybody who would like to put their plan into his plan. And that's the bigger player. So here, this divide of Iran, Sunni, uh, Shiite, can, can, be, uh, can be a bigger divide. Can you manage it? Even if you like to have a divide, I don't know. In the history, there were divides between the, the religion and nations that could help a bigger and an outsider power to, to, to strengthen its uh, or to build its, its power. But, but always the big powers were aware of managing such divides. So there is this, the Iran also proved that can, it, it would have been able, it was able to create, when Khomeini was alive, after the Iranian revolution, they created the similar brutalities, uh, brutal groups like the Taliban of today, which is, it belongs to the Sunnis world. So these are the potentials. I, if I have one minute, I know everybody would like to leave and this, these talks are not going to be ended, to say one thing. It, it is not my point of view. I read about it and I agree with it. With it. Uh, we are, I mean, before that, let's see, what is happening today here, it was happening after the end of Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. The stabilization of that area, the peninsula, took from 1916 to 1936-37. The stabilization of Syria took two, three years, 1920-1922, around 1920-25. Egypt, 1919-1920. So there was a decade from 1960, just after the for, end of First World War, until the beginning of 1940s, even to some extent the Second World War, where these two big imperial powers of the time, Britain and France, needed and felt to be there to deal with it. Of course, I'm talking about this region, and there is also the Mediterranean one. 
So the point I would like to make is that when a big power is intervening somewhere, uh, with, with the magnitude of the, of the intervention we see in Afghanistan, for 50 countries, NATO with troops, and, and, and uh, the, the, the also on the other side, all terrorist groups that are trying to, to resist and, war, and fight, in such, and then, of course, it is happening after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and all these jihadi groups fighting up against the Soviet Union. We, what we see is that the underlining realities of that region uh, has been distorted. So it is, it's no problem for the big power outside. For example, after the First World War, it was... Uh, Britain and France, now it is the United States and NATO. It's, it's not the big problem if they stay long enough to deal with it. And in Balkan, what happened? The situation became very distorted. But NATO is, is there. It is heart of Europe. European Union is there. You can't leave it. So you deal with it little by little until it is going to be managed. The problem is if you leave that area sooner than necessary, you will deal with a situation that is only feeding the, the most, the worst negative trends that you can, you can think about. Is it good for the future? I, of course, it's, it's a, it can be a subject of academic debate, debate among people like you. But I, my big fear is the impatient of Americans, not at, at, at ordinary level, as you see it in the media, right? The impatient of, of dealing with that complexity of, 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 uh, uh, of that big region uh, within, uh, within the time, the timing they have in mind on the basis of the past experiences. We deal with a very different situation which needs time, patience, resources. Of course, one can say that why we should be there. This is an internal question. But when it comes to us, we think uh, we are in the whole of this region and, uh, we, and that's, we need each other to work together uh, to herald a new future. This was really a strategic I'm really grateful to what you just said now. In geopolitical history, there, is, there are three very simple questions. Why, how, or by whom, and when. And I was always struggling with this issue. And I tried to explain before why we have 2011 spring. Why 2011? I explained in writings and here why we had the Yugoslav disintegration when we had it. You had the Soviet disintegration, you had the death of Josip Broz Tito before that, and you had a change in the overall European architecture. You have actually, as I've always referred to, at one point you had an international triple crisis. German unification, Kuwait, and Soviet disintegration. All within the same 18 months. Total overflow of crisis management. You just rightly indicated, and I actually just was in the same palace in Lausanne a couple of weeks ago, where the Treaty of Lausanne was signed with the Ottomans, with the Turks, in 1922. That in that part of the world, as a result of the then Great War, in the spirit of Woodrow Wilson, we had this disintegration on change. 
However, at that time, we still had two ordering powers. Because it was before East of Suez. The United Kingdom and France. And now I paraphrase Joschka Fischer, who when we talked together in 2006 here, the argument was that the Middle East will be stable as long as there is a continued American umbrella, an American power projection. As long as you have that somewhere, that ordering might somewhere, the actors really from the Gulf westwards will be under a certain way. As of post 2009-2008, it was perceived that the U.S. might not fulfill its function anymore. So the question now is, to which degree we have now the answer where we are going with this. The question is, how long it will take the region to find an equilibrium and how much it will take to stabilize the region in and around and for Afghanistan. <laughs> with all this, thank you very much. <laughs> and we have a wonderful